This morning we're going to begin a new series, I guess for a lack of a better word. Um, there was a book written several years ago by Tom Rainer, and the book was entitled I Will. So the thoughts for these sermons over the next several weeks are coming from that book, I Will. And it's just simply talking about what it means for us to be church members. And if you ever stop and think about it, what does it mean to be a church member? Now, many of us have this concept of when we come to Christ, we join a church, and that's the end of it. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus does not save us to sit, to soak it up, and to sour. He saves us to serve. I'm going to say that one more time. Jesus does not save us to sit in a pew, to soak up the message, and then not do anything with it, and we just sour. He saves us to serve. And so we're going to be looking at what it means to be a church member over the next several weeks. When it comes to being a church member, would you say that you're active? Would you say to yourself, I'm an active church member? Now, don't answer that just yet. Many church members are regular attenders. There's times that we would stop and we would say, I shoulda, I coulda, I woulda, and I might. Now you stop and think about those statements. I shoulda done that, or I could have done that, I would have done that, or I might. That's not active. That's a passive church member that's just coming in and sitting and just taking it in. Saying I am a church member is one thing. When we say I am a church member, I had the opportunity to serve in Macon, Macon, Georgia for a little over eight years. I was a youth pastor at one church. I pastored another church in Macon. Now, the thing in Macon is this. There were two churches for a hundred years that were the churches in Macon. One was Tabernacle, where I had the opportunity to serve as a youth pastor, and the other was Mabel White. Well, anybody that ever lived in Macon would say the statement, I am a member of Tabernacle, or I am a member of Mabel White, and most of them, during their lifetime, would have been members at both of them on several occasions, because those were the two churches that people swapped between. Now, I want you to think about that. I am a church member. Being the right kind or the biblical kind of church member is another thing. Membership has requirements. Any of you that have ever joined any kind of civic organization understands to be a member of that organization, there are certain requirements. Some of them you have to pay dues. Some of them you have to be at the meetings on a regular basis. If you don't pay your dues and you're not at meetings on a regular basis, they'll kick you out. Well, the thing about it is they'll let you back in as long as you catch up the dues and you start coming to meetings. But when it comes to being a church member, shouldn't there be a little bit higher requirement? Jesus saves us. We become part of his body, which is called the church, and we should be more concerned about what that means than anything else in life. What does it mean to be a church member? I think that some of us need to go back and listen to the Hank Williams Jr. song. Now, some of you are saying, well, preacher, what are you talking about Hank Williams Jr. from the pulpit for? Because he had a song that we all need to pay attention to that was called an attitude adjustment. Some of you are laughing. You remember that song, don't you? I think as church members on occasionally, we need an attitude adjustment. Amen? We need to understand why Jesus saved us and what it means to be a church member. Here are a couple of questions I want you to consider as we move into our time in the Word today. What will it take for Bethel to have an impact for the sake of the gospel in the world around us? What will it take for Bethel to have an impact for the gospel of Jesus in the world around us? And another question is this. What's it going to take to see growth at Bethel, both numerically, but more importantly, spiritual. What's it going to take for us to see that spiritual growth? Here's what it's going to take. I'm going to answer both of those questions in one statement. It's going to take outward-focused Christians. I want you to think about that. 
It's going to take outward focused Christians where we're no longer have that inner focus where all we're looking at is what happens in these walls. It's going to take all of us as members of Bethel Baptist Church to start focusing our attention outside the walls of this church. So over the next several weeks, we're going to look at what that means to be an outwardly focused Christian. Starting today, I want us to think about one thing, and that is moving from I am to I will. All of us can say, I am a church member. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Went to a church, I was the pastor of the church, and I was in the community one time and had the opportunity to meet with a guy, and I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, when you attend church, where do you attend? He said, oh, I am a member of, and he filled in the blank. That was the church that I had just became pastor of. I said, well, what about the new pastor? Have you met him yet? No, I haven't met him yet, but he was a member of that church. I'd been there for about three months and had never laid eyes on the guy. But he said, I am a member. Well, membership has much more involved in it than just saying, I am one. So as we move through this morning, I want us to move from I am to I will. It's easy to say I'm a church member. What needs to happen is say I will be a biblical church member. I will be what Jesus saved me to be. I will be what it takes to do what God has for us to do here at Bethel Baptist Church. Having the right or changing our attitude about what church membership is will change the way that we see the world around us. So that's what I want us to focus on this morning. I want us to embrace the joy and the experience of what it means to be a biblical church member. In case you don't know, I want to lay this out. Just in case you don't know, did you know there is no such thing as a perfect church? Two people believe it. (laughs) There's no such thing as a perfect church, but I want to take it one step further and I know I'm going to get some amens on this one. Did you know there's no such thing as a perfect pastor? Uh Uh-huh, so I told you, we're going to get a bunch of amens on that one. There's no such thing as a perfect church. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor. There's no such thing as a perfect staff. There's no such thing as a perfect ministry. There's no such thing as a perfect church member. I heard crickets on that one. But here's the thing. I want you to pay close attention to this next statement. We serve and have been saved by a perfect Savior. Amen? Amen. And He gives us the instructions we need in His Word to move from the statement of I am, just that simple attitude of I am a church member and I attend and I, I show up whenever I can. But did you know that an I am church member a lot of times is the CEO of the church? Some of you are going, huh? CEO, Christmas, Easter, and other special occasions. But we need to move from that I am to I will, and that is I will attend, I will be active in the ministry that God has going on at the church that he's placed me in. And that's where we need to be. So I want us to look at some scripture this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word, find your way to Ephesians chapter 4. That's where we're going to start. We're going to lay it out in scripture, and then we're going to talk about what it means to move from I am a church member to I will be what Christ saved me to be. As you're finding your way to Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to ask God to bless this time together. Father, as we come into your presence, we have passed the gates of praise. We have spent time lifting our voices to you through song. And Father, now it's time for us to open our hearts for you to till the soil of our hearts so that you can plant the seed of your word deep inside so that it takes root and it begins to grow in each of our lives. And Father, may that happen here. May that happen now. May we be receptive to what you have for us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is writing this church. And he says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Paul is saying, I'm laying it out for you here, church at Ephesus. This is what it looks like 
to be an I will church member. I will do these things. Paul is just laying it out. But notice what he says. He says, I urge you to walk in the manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. If you've been saved this morning by the marvelous, matchless grace of Jesus Christ, let it be known by a resounding amen. Amen. That's the calling that Paul's talking about. If you've been saved, if Jesus has called you to salvation, this is what your life needs to look like when it pertains to the church. And so he's laying it out for us. Now I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2 real quick, and we're going to read a few, a few verses from there. If it sounds a little bit odd to you, I'm reading from the ESV this morning. The words are on the screen. You can follow along in your copy of God's Word. But in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, Paul writes, this is my favorite passage in all of Scripture. I love this passage of Scripture because Paul just punches you in the face with it. He says, starts off, he says, have this mind in you which is yours in Christ Jesus. He starts off, he says, I'm not pulling punches. I'm not wasting any time. You think like Jesus thinks. And so he says, have this mind in you which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, Being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death, on the cross. And the church said, amen. That's what Jesus did for us. That's what Jesus did for each and every one of us who will place our faith in him. So with these two passages of Scripture, let's unpack what it looks like to move from an I am to an I will church member. The first thing, the first step that we're going to take here is this. I am a unifying church member. I am a unifying church member. When we stop and say, I'm going to be part of the unity of the Spirit in the body of Christ. I'm going to, I'm going to be a catalyst for unity. That's what Paul says, unity of the Spirit. Did you know that unity is essential for everything in life? If you play on a sports team, it takes unity. If you're in a business, it takes unity. If you have a family, say amen, it takes unity to raise a family. If you're in a church, it takes unity. We can't all be going in a thousand different directions in the church function like Christ wants it to function. We have to be unified in what Christ has called us to do. This only works when we say, I will be a team player when it comes to being a church member. I'm going to get on board with the mission of the church. I'm going to get on board with the ministries of the church, and I'm going to do what Christ has saved me to do. When we put the group's need ahead of the individual needs, that's when we move to just from saying, I am a church member to I will be the church member Christ saved me to be. It's more about, it's more about the group than it is about me. It's not, it's not about me. It's about what God wants here. But Paul didn't stop there. He didn't stop at just unity. He says, listen, unity requires humility. Unity requires humility. That means others first. We put ourselves on the back burner, and it's all about the other person first and foremost. In fact, we need to be cheerleaders doing that cheer on the sideline of the church saying, I'm number three. Now, we're used to saying, I'm number one. And if you're a Georgia Bulldog fan, you said, that's all we think about is we need to be number one. We need to be number one. But I got news for you. It has no place in church. Being number one has no place in in, in God's house because we need to say, I'm number three. Jesus first, others second, and we're third. When we put Jesus first and foremost over everything, when we take ourselves out of the spotlight and put others' needs in front of us, that's when unity happens, when we we humble ourselves to saying, I'm number three. And I got news for you. I'll be number three all day long if it serves the purpose that Jesus won't serve here at Bethel. But it also requires gentleness. Paul says it's humility, it's gentleness, that's tempers, that's kindness. That's biting your tongue when you have the opportunity to just lash out at somebody. Uh Uh-oh, he's meddling now, ain't he? Gentleness, being able to say, I'm not going to say what's on my mind, I'm going to honor Christ with my tongue. But he also says be patient. Uh Uh-oh, that's the one I have the hardest time with. Patience is not a virtue in my life (laughs) because I'm working on it. Now, here's the thing. Don't pray for patience. 
because trials and tribulation works patience. If you pray for it, you're going to go through all kinds of troubles to get it. But we need to work to having patience. Patience is part of unity. That's putting up with the attitudes of some in the church that don't have the same attitude that Christ wants out of us. That, that are, let's just refer to them as the holy knotheads, okay? Don't look around the room. I see some people glance. Don't do that. We need to have patience. But he also says we need to be acceptant of one another in love. If you looked around this room, you're going to see multiple different looks. People are dressed different. People come from different walks of life. We need to say, it's not just about me. And a lot of churches have this mentality of us four and no more. But it's about being accepting of those who might not fit the mold that we grew up in. But just saying, Jesus accepts us like we are. He accepts us like we are, but he doesn't leave us like we are, and he changes us. And we need to be accepting to saying, whosoever will. Aren't you glad Jesus said whosoever will to you when you got saved? And we need to say the same thing about others. Whosoever will. So here's the question. Will you be a unifying church member? Next one is, can you say, I'm a sacrificial church member? I'm a sacrificial church member. Now, some of you, the first place your mind's going to go is, that man has been preaching on giving money for the last two or three weeks. That's not where I'm going. All right? You can hold on to your pocketbook because I'm not going after it. But are you a, can you say, I'm a sacrificial church member? When you go to Philippians chapter 2 and you read verses 5 through 8, have this mind, have this attitude, have Christ shine through you. Think about Jesus. And if there was one word that would describe Jesus outside of Savior and Lord, it would be sacrificial. Jesus sacrificed himself so that we can have eternal life through him and no other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen, church? Jesus sacrificed himself for us. So we're to have this mind in ourselves, which is ours through Christ Jesus, that we need to be sacrificial when it comes to church. We need to let Jesus shine through us no matter what. Dr. Benny Tate, as he helped me through a lot of ministry situations and I've had an opportunity to talk to him, had him come and preach at a church. And Dr. Benny Tate tells this story of a little girl going home with her parents from Sunday school. And the mom and dad were in the front seat, little girl was in the back seat, and she was probably five or six years old. And the parents were doing what most parents do. What did you learn in Sunday school this morning? Well, little girl's all excited. We learned about Jesus. So the mom asked her, well, what about Jesus did you learn? She said, we learned that Jesus comes and lives in our heart. And the mom's talking with the little girl, said, yeah, when we pray and ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to come and be the Lord and Savior of our life, he comes and he lives in our heart. And the little girl had this puzzled look on her face. And she looks at her mom with a serious question. She says, Mom, Jesus is big enough to hold the world, right? Mom said, absolutely. The Bible says he holds the world in his hands. And she said, and Jesus is bigger than I am, isn't he? And the mom said, yeah, Jesus is bigger than you are. She said, but he comes and lives in my heart, right? And the mom said, absolutely. The Bible tells us that he'll come and he'll live in your heart. The little girl made a statement that we all need to hold on to. She said, if Jesus is big enough to hold the world, and Jesus is big enough or bigger than I am, and he comes and lives in my heart, shouldn't he poke through? Think about it. If Jesus is within us, he should be poking through. He should be showing through us so that everybody can see. We're to have an attitude of Christ. We're to have the mind of Christ. We're to follow his example. Jesus' attitude, his mindset, took him to the cross for you and for me. That was the ultimate sacrifice. We're to have the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ for his church. I want you to say two words for me this morning. I want you to say his church. Say that with me. His church. Say it one more time. His church. This church doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to you. This church belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. And we're to have his mindset when it comes to his church. 
So I want you to find your way back to Philippians. You may still be there. Because Paul, in verse 5, he just punches you in the face. Have this mind in you which is yours in Christ Jesus. Well, what mind was he talking about? Go to Philippians 2, back up to verse 1. He says, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation of the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being, being full accord of one mind, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. And then he says, have this mind in you, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's talking about all those things he just laid out. We're to have sympathy. We're to be affectionate. We're not to be rivals. We're not to be conceited. We're to be, we're to be humble. Thinking of others more than we think of ourselves. Have this mind in you. So, what are some areas in our life that we need to work on to be that sacrificial church member? To have the mind of Christ. In a lot of cases, everything but church. Everything but church is no sacrifice. We'll be busy about our day. We'll be busy about everything else, and we will not sacrifice for the church. We'll sacrifice for everything else. But Jesus says we need to be sacrificial when it comes to his church. The same instructions given 2,000 years ago are still in place today, amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but nothing in this book has changed since the day Jesus had man, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, put it on paper. And he says, this is the attitude you are to have toward my church. So will you be a unifying church member? Will you be a sacrificing church member? And can you say, I am a prayerful church member? Uh Uh-oh. I'm a prayerful church member. Paul says in Philippians, when he opened it up, I used it this morning. When I think of you in all my prayers, I think of you for your partnership in the gospel from the first until now. In all my prayers, Paul was praying. You know, all throughout my ministry, I've had the opportunity to be involved with some people who are prayer warriors. And there's some prayer warriors right here at Bethel. But I was thinking as I was putting some thoughts down on paper this week and I was looking and you know, thinking about what it means to say, I am a prayerful church member. Tom Williams, you had the privilege of meeting Pastor Tom. He was with us for revival. From the day I graduated high school, Tom Williams has never ceased to pray for me or anybody else who has ever come through his youth ministry or has asked him to pray for them. He prays for them every single day. If I called up Pastor Tom this afternoon and say, hey, I just got a question for you. Did you pray for me this morning? Wouldn't be any hesitation. Absolutely. He's got a list. There's no telling how long it takes him to pray. He's a prayer warrior. He is a prayerful church member. But then I had the privilege of knowing Evelyn Trimble and Ellen Skinner and Margaret McCook and Bonnie Cowart, these ladies who were diligent in their prayer life. And every time they saw me, they said, hey, I prayed for you today. I was lifting up you. I was lifting up the church. They were diligent in their prayer life. They were prayerful church members, all prayer warriors who prayed for me and for the church. I just kept, they just kept coming back and coming back and coming back. So I asked this question, will you be a prayerful church member, lifting up the pastor, lifting up the staff, lifting up the ministries of this church. Are you praying for me? Are you praying for Chris? Are you praying for the deacons? Are you praying for each other? Are you praying for Bethel? Are you praying for Bethel's mission? And here's one. Are you praying for those that you know that are lost? Are you a prayerful church member? There were five young college students that were in London And as they were in London, they decided they wanted to go hear Charles Spurgeon preach on Sunday morning. And anybody who had the opportunity to go into the Metropolitan Tabernacle would go because they wanted to hear this prince of preachers. So they're going in and they enter the doors. And as they were entering, this this elderly man greeted them at the door. And he said, gentlemen, I'm so glad that you're here today. I'd like to show you around. I I want you to see a little bit of what's happening here 
at, at uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle, so they said, absolutely. He said, I want to take you and I want to show you the heating plant of the church. And these young men were scratching their head and they said, you know, we really don't care anything about seeing a furnace and coal and all that, but this man's being nice to us. And so he says, follow me downstairs. I want to show you the heating plant of the church. So this man followed them down and they were kind of curious about why, because it was in July, it was hot. They knew that the furnace wouldn't be on, so why would he want to show me the heating plant of the church? They go down the stairways and they quietly, he quietly opens the door in the basement of, of, of Metropolitan Tabernacle. And as he quietly opened that door, these young men looked in and this man said, this is our hating plant. And to the surprise of all five of those young men that came to hear Pastor Spurgeon preach on Sunday morning, here was a room that was full of 700 or more people with their heads bowed praying over the service. That will heat up a church, folks. When you have people on their face during the service, lifting up the pastor, lifting up what's going on, seeking a blessing in the service, softly, the man closed the door. The gentleman then introduced himself and said, gentlemen, my name is Charles Spurgeon. He was more concerned about the people that were praying. That's what gave him the power to preach because he had people behind him praying. When it comes to prayer, E.M. Bounds writes this, Talking to men for God is a great thing, but talking to God for men is greater still. Going before the creator of the universe and having time to spend time with him. Hudson Taylor, the great missionary, had this to say, The prayer power has never been tried to its full capacity. If we want to see mighty wonders of divine power and grace wrought in the place of of weakness, failure, and disappointment, let us answer God's standing challenge. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Do you understand that when you go before the creator of the universe with your request, God himself stops everything, listens to you, and answers your request? Do you believe in the power of prayer? All right, there we go. I'm just checking. Prayer is the power that fuels the church. Will you be a praying church member? Paul told the church, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Jesus sets the example of prayer. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Did you catch that prayer that Paul prayed? Folks, write it down. Circle it. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Pray that for me every day. I'm begging you. I want to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to have the, the prayers of the saints poured over me. Will you be a unifying church member? Will you be a sacrificing church member? Will you be a prayerful church member? And the final thought this morning, can you say that I am a joyful church member? A joyful church member. Now, I want you to think about this. Joy does not always equate with happiness. Joy does not necessarily mean happy. And I want to give you an example. Think about the funeral of a believer. Somebody who dedicated themselves to Christ their entire life. And you're at the funeral service where you're recognizing the life well lived for Jesus. Funerals should be a celebration of life. But don't we shed tears at funerals? If you don't shed tears at funerals, something might be wrong. Even at my dad's funeral, I was shedding tears. And he lived his life for Christ. I was joyful over the fact that that man raised me. I was joyful over the fact that I knew where he was, but I was not happy that he was gone. You see the difference between joy and happy? Are you a joyful church member? Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He says, if you didn't catch it the first time, I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. 
So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. That peace that passes all understanding can equate directly to joy. I have the joy of the Lord. I might not be happy all the time, but I have the joy of the Lord. Will you be a joyful church member? Happiness is an emotion, and emotions can lie. But joy is something that's seated deep within us, and it can only come through that relationship with Christ Jesus, having the joy of Christ in your life. Do you experience the joy of Christ this morning, church? Let me hear it. All right, four of you do. But joy in Christ means having something that we can't explain. But so many times we go to church and we can find the GCMs, which are the grumpy church members. They jump off the page at you, don't they? I couldn't help but think when I was thinking about this of the movie, Grumpy Old Men. <laughs> Remember that movie with Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau? Funny movie. But isn't that the same for church sometimes? You come in and you look and people look like grumpy cat. They just got a frown that's implanted on their face. Those people can be the constant complainers. They can be the biggest critics of the pastor, the staff, the ministries of the church. They're the ones who has the attitude that everything in the church should only be to my benefit. Whose church is it, church? Tell me. Jesus' church, absolutely. Jesus established the church. It's not ours. It doesn't belong to us. We can spot those GCMs, but what about the JCMs, the joyful church members, those that you just, you know when you get there, they're going to have a smile on their face. It doesn't matter how they feel. It doesn't matter if their back's hurting, if their head's hurting, if they got a, if they got a toothache. It doesn't matter if they got an ingrown toenail. They're going to they're have a, a joyful smile on their face because they know that they're going to get to spend the next couple of hours with their family members in Christ, and they're going to get to hear from God through His Word. They're going to get to sing praises to Him. And I don't know about you, but I would rather look at a room full of joyful church members than grumpy church members any day of the week. Those are the people that we know are going to be here. And I can't, I, my mind just goes back in time. I was a youth pastor at Tabernacle in Macon, and every kid referred to him as the candy man, Mr. Bob O'Neill. When you walked into the church, Mr. Bob was going to be standing there, and he's going to have a, I mean, his pocket's bulging. Every kid in that church was rushing to him because he was a joyful church member. He wanted to be there. I was honored when his family called and asked me to come back and have part of his homegoing service. That was just an honor for me because it was an honor to be in that place with Mr. Bob O'Neill because he was joyful that he was going to be at church every single time he had an opportunity. Go back a little bit further. And I wish I could have known him a lot longer, but Cindy grew up with him. And that was Reginald Mullis. Reginald Mullis has cerebral palsy, but he was going to be on the front steps of Southside Baptist Church, passing bulletins out, smiling, saying good morning every single Sunday morning that went by. Reginald was going to be there. And you were happy to see him because he was happy to be where he was. He was a joyful church member. And then there was another one, Sherry Teal. She was part of our church in Macon at Wesleyan Drive. Sherry had cerebral palsy, was confined to a wheelchair. She couldn't walk. She couldn't talk. But you, it didn't matter. Her caregiver was going to bring her to church on Sunday, was going to bring her Sunday night, was going to bring her on Wednesday, was going to bring her to every extracurricular activity you had. We had a mission, uh, a mission program that we did every summer with students, and she was there every single night. She would work in the kitchen, do what she could. She couldn't do anything but just have a smile on her face. But she was one of those joyful church members that you were just happy to see because she was happy to be where her family in Christ was. Are you a joyful church member? Joyful church members encourages the pastor, encourages the staff, always focusing on the good, always grateful for being able to be part of what God has established. Be a joyful church member. Remember, 
if you're going to revert to that grumpy church member, if you grumble and talk about the church, you're grumbling and talking about yourself because this building and the programs are not the church. Each one of us sitting in the pew is the church. Don't grumble about yourself. Paul tells us that we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Where do you fall? Here's the question. And I want, I want you to think about this question as we come to a conclusion this morning. This was one that is going to take all of us a little bit of time just to let it soak into our mind. Would you say that your commitment to the church is more or less than it was five years or ten years ago? Your commitment to the church, is it more or less than it was five years or ten years ago? If it's less, we need to be on our face at this altar saying, God, forgive me because I've lost the joy of what it means to be in Christ, to be a church member. There was a time not so long ago where people would never even consider doing anything on Sunday other than being at church. When you're at church, then afterwards you can have the day. But nothing ever got in front of the church. It's time for us to consider what we are when it comes to church. God is not looking for chickens. He's looking for pigs. Some of you are looking at me like I've lost my mind. Think about it. Think about breakfast. Some of you ate breakfast this morning. God's not looking for chickens when it comes to being a church member. He's looking for pigs. A chicken, when it comes to breakfast, contributes to breakfast. The chicken will lay an egg. Unless you go to Chick-fil-A, you know, but we're not going there. We're talking about eggs. But a hog, when it comes to breakfast, has to be totally committed. Chicken contributes. The hog is totally committed. Because you can't have bacon with a contributing hog. He has to commit to it. God's looking for, for pigs and not chickens. So it's time for us to consider whole hog commitment to Christ and his church. Are you an I am or are you an I will church member? I will be unifying. I will be sacrificing. I will be praying. I will be joyful. Where's your commitment level? Is it on the level of the chicken or is it on the level of the pig? You first must commit your life to Christ as Savior before you can commit to his church. There may be someone here this morning that is not committed to Christ's church because you've never yet committed your life to Christ as Savior and Lord. It's got to start there. You can't have commitment to the body of Christ until you become part of the body of Christ. This morning, if that's you, and you would look at me and say, Preacher, I, there's never been a time in my life that I've got on my face and said, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Jesus, I need a Savior, and you're the only one that can save me. I want to repent of my sin. I want to ask you to cleanse me of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you went to the grave, but I believe God raised you from the grave. I believe that you're seated at the right hand of God. I believe that you're coming back again. Jesus, I want to place my faith in you and in no one else. If that has never happened in your life, may today be the day of salvation because according to Scripture, not according to what I think, according to Scripture, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not you should be, not you could be, not you might be, but you will be saved. Today can be the day of salvation for you. It's got to start there before you can commit to Christ's church. But I'm talking to believers now. As a believer in Christ, as part of the body of Christ, as part of his church, are you an attending part of the body or are you an activated part of the body? 
Are you active in the ministry and the mission that God has for us? There may be some here this morning that have just been battling the decision. I, don't, I haven't quite plugged in yet. Well, I'm here to tell you, as Bethel Baptist Church and the membership of Bethel Baptist Church will all say amen when I finish this statement, as the body of Bethel Baptist Church, if God has led you here, we want you to be part of this body. We want you to be a member of this body. We want you to be active in this body. We want you to plug in to the mission and the ministry of what God is going to do in and through Bethel Baptist Church. And the membership said? Amen. So if that's you this morning and you've not yet placed your membership here at Bethel and God's leading you in that direction, we never want to drag, we never want to pry, and I'll never embarrass. But if God is leading you, we've got a place for you. It will take all of us moving from I am to I will in order for us to accomplish the task that's unfinished that God has for Bethel to be about.